It's John Mackett here and Eamon McFadden this week uh, on the Tribune podcast. It's the 38th week of the year and as always the Tribune is full of news, colour, scandal and a whole lot more. Lots of pictures and we're back printing in our, in our own hometown again after last week's trip to Tralee which is really, really exciting. Anyway, that gets us around to looking at some of the big items in the news I just see today that the HSE is still relying on obsolete PCs after cyber hack. Now, you'll be more of an expert than I would aim on this thing. The HSE is still running obsolete Windows 7 on almost 30,000 computers, six months after it was hit by a de- devastating cyber attack. Mm-hmm. The out-of-date PCs have been branded as potentially vulnerable. Yeah. I would say that's an understatement. Yeah, how, sure. dated, how dated is that? Well, at the rate of the technology changes now, that would be quite antiquated, you know. Like, those things are there to, they need to be updated to keep them secure, to keep them safe. And more and more stuff is obviously going online. Almost all records are online now. So they would need to be keeping that up, the most sensitive data to the highest levels continually. So that would be quite obsolete. Plus, it must be slowing their whole system down for the workers. Like, that's that's old, older technology now, you know. So you'd like to think that would deserve better there's 30,000 of them still in operation but more significantly than that and this is from the Irish Independent 12,000 of these cannot be replaced or upgraded because they are associated with specialised machines such as x-ray or laboratory devices that seems seems almost incredible Uh, but if you think about it now all those machines are computer powered Oh, um, everything's so computer powered. Computer powered. So, but but why? How they've gotten them to be a position where they can't they can't swap them out for more modern technology? Even you know that it was better it, laptops or better hardware. You'd think that would it be. It can't be money. Computers today are cheap. Yeah, they come down in price. Operating systems are cheap. A uh, Windows Ten, Windows, all all of those latest Windows, hmm. they're all relatively cheap, and even from the, from the point of view of your own security, and retaining your 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 material in, in your system whether it's been hacked you need to be right up to date on that it's hard to believe that they're that they're actually at that point well it's even strange it's like that they can't change it that's if they're that's what they're saying if they can't swap it out for that machinery without making it obsolete which is very unusual but that leads us nicely into what is our one of our front page stories we have numbers of them today mm-hmm. and we have this one luh scans processed in australia now this story has been kicking about for numbers of months in fact until last year because i understand this is going on going on for probably nearly 18 months now out of our ct imaging uh scans are being read in australia hmm. uh, we have put that to the hse in uh, no letter th- than last night and they've come back and said that is the is the case uh, this was raised by a visitor to the hospital some time back when his elderly mother had to have a scan and they were told right the, uh, the out of hours radiologists are no longer on duty hmm. and this would have to go to Australia. But not to worry, it should be back in two hours, which it was. So this led to the man just saying, why is this happening? A, is, there, is there reduced numbers in radiology or do they not have any out of hours service at all? Hmm. But that's not the case at all, or so they say. Uh, we sent this query asking if, if this decision would impact on staffing levels in the radiology department. And this, they said there is no reduction in radiology staff, so that begs the question, why are they sending these things off to Australia? The, this is a quote from their response. Our local radiologists are always on call to complement and support the service, said the response. Uh, that is where we're at with that there. We didn't learn an awful lot, mm-hmm. as is often the case when you put a query into the HSE, all you're doing there is uh, getting a confirmation that this is the case, but we didn't get a confirmation as to why it is the case, yeah. and is there any extra cost involved or any of those things. That's the you don't get point. You don't get those answers from official Ireland anymore. No. But that is one of the things that's in there. Another thing that's just coming up this evening there, and it's on, it's on the statement that Leo Varadkar made uh, on Monday night that... Uh, the 100% redress wasn't probable was the term that he used. Now, Michael McGrath, the expenditure minister, was out of the traps like a shot this morning to say that as far as they're concerned, everything is on the table and there's nothing off the table. Hmm. And this evening, 
uh, a number of TDs, including Joe McHugh, uh, have sought a meeting with uh, the Tanisha. Now, I don't know if it's the semantics of the thing, or what is it that they don't want to know, or do want to know, mm. or that they don't already know. Because Pat Carey is one of them. Uh, who's the other one? There's, there, there's a, there's a t- the, the, the three TDs are on the Western Seaboard. And possibly they have got a lot of flack over the last 24 hours about Varadkar's remarks. Yeah. Now, Varadkar's not throwing that out there off the top of his head, I do believe, because there's a general belief that while ministers and senior ministers have been very, very cautious around commenting on it, none of them has, has said that full Micah Redress is going to be considered, especially if you look at the context of the Micah Redress uh, documents produced last week mm. by the Donegal Group here, and they've done a very, very good job on this. And here they're stating very, very clearly in one of the, one of the important pages, uh, notably, Minister O'Brien's assertion that the existing scheme is working for the majority of affected families can, be clear, can clearly be seen to be untrue. Based on our figures and up-to-date submissions at the, at the action group, only 19% of affected families live in homes where the DBS covers the proposed 90%. So there's huge amounts of money to be made up here. Just just very briefly, a house of 2,500 square feet will require expenditure of €367,808. Euro. Mm-hmm. Those are big, big figures. and With only 60, 60 to 58 to 67% of that cost being met? 58 to 67%. And you see... 31% of houses are in that category and then you move up a notch to the 3,000 and yeah, there's so numbers. The, those are the majority, not the... Yeah, not there's, the ma- there's a lot. Well, they're, they're 58%. 423,283 for a full rebuild there. Now, you look at a figure of literally half that being allocated by the government. Hmm. Uh, and while Michael McGrath this morning uh, paddled his way around avoiding the basic, the, the basic facts presented there, I would say his back is to the wall because at, at the moment the whole housing programme is coming a, coming adrift at the seams. Dar O'Brien is having a disastrous time because the scheme that he announced for the for for uh, one the scheme that he announced two weeks ago for the shared ownership that is not fully thought out, therefore it hasn't been fully cleared by by, by the central bank. Mm. Now he's rowing back on that like hell. He says the bits of it that uh, are completed have have been accepted, but you don't go go to the central bank with a bit of a thing, with a bit of a scheme. Well, well up. So now it has so happened that the, his rent cap plan has suddenly been blown asunder because he hadn't factored in the three percent inflation that, 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 that that's that's been hiked onto rents, and given that the, they we're heading into the winter. The housing crisis is going to worsen. And I was talking to a well-known councillor in Letter Kenny yesterday, who was simply saying to me, given the crisis with accommodation for the for the uh, students at the LYIT, there isn't a single bed to be found in Letter Kenny. Mm-hmm. Every bed is, is used up and probably and probably is, they're not all back at, at college yet. And if you look at Dublin, the, the big universities coming back. They, the students have nowhere to go, yeah. you know. And what does that say about the whole housing problem and the whole housing crisis? And where does it, what bit of the housing, of the housing plan, housing for all, it's called, that that seems to be just falling apart. It seems, yeah. No. Despite the fact that they're allocating four billion a year to it, now we don't expect miracles, but when you have bits of that, a, uh, coming apart, before you even start uh, digging down deeper into it. It doesn't look that good. But you have another story then, and we're moving to a wellness cafe yeah. story. So there wee stories there from the this these wellness cafes are a, are sort of a, a relatively recent um, thing here in the county, but uh, there's been one up and running in Metterkenny for a couple of years, and there's one now set for the Swally Mulroy area as well. The, so it's a group of people who have lived experiences with mental health difficulties and community workers have come together and they set up these wellness cafes. Um, uh, it's a de- effectively a development group to support uh, people in the area who've 
had experiences with mental health difficulties and it's done in quite a nice and formal casual setting um it's obviously working because i know that as i say the letter kenny one's been going since 2019 swilly mulroy is about to launch uh in the, in the coming weeks um i think it's october 1st now they're due to have their first one and it's going to move around the area yeah, relatively. Yeah. and there's even training to has taken place as far over as guidor i think so that's just affords people an opportunity to kind of get together socialize you know like the social isolation that goes with a lot of these things yeah it's yeah a, it's a really g- good idea um you know they can people can go along but to it's these. time for a lot of things to start getting back Aye. up and running again they have it's, to. It's, it is very slow actually yeah you know out and about this week there's no noticeable change from last week or the week before yeah. there isn't that movement of people that you'd expect but we're settling into the one or two john you see that's yeah well, you i know, know that but you but know that you know slow people, and steady people are very reluctant to get out and about and to become involved in things hmm but I'll tell you, here's something that people might become involved in on Saturday night. Oh. The Lennon Lodge in Remelton has been sold, <laughs> and obviously there's a purchaser, but we're dealing with that somewhere else. That'll be in the way. Uh, I've lost my front page, so uh, I'm going to have to go back to this here because I'll, I'll have to read what I believe <laughs> I, I actually wrote. Uh, the Lennon Lodge has been there since uh, the 5th of December 1998. Now, Seamus Durkin was in town. He bought a pub called Duffy's, which was a, which was a nice village pub. Mm. But he bought a, he bought a very, or he built a very elegant premises there. Uh, there's fourteen bedrooms around there. There's there's big like lounge, a small there's hotel bedrooms. really near them with a the bar. It would be a lovely little hotel. But before all that happens, he'll be pulling his last pint Saturday night. Might I think they have grease until a minute after midnight or something. It's been sold for an undisclosed sum, because that's nothing new. And Seamus confirmed it at the weekend on social media. And they're having this last... So their farewell night is going to be a yeah, farewell night. night. Some of our biggest nights for photography and for the crack was in Dorkins over the last 20 years or more. That opening night they had the local heartthrob, Paul McCahalley, the punters rocking on, on the tables. And that has gone on ever since. And to see Huge, huge crowds go to it. The big nights and the, the for the football, the soccer, soccer World match, Cups and all uh, that would have been huge. World there. Cups were huge, but you know the hospitality in Durkins was always top class, and they've had a thing. Their Melton is famous for the pantomime, so makeup and drag and all that kind of thing comes very easily to them, and they've run shows like the Axe Factor and the Weakest Link, and the fashion statements by some of them was just absolutely out of this atmosphere entirely so that's all coming to an end as a new proprietor comes in and takes over and we wish them well and we'll see how long does it take Uh, probably the premises may well be refurbished maybe closed for a spell i'm not too sure Mm. i haven't discussed that with the new owners although they're not officially announced yet but uh, they will do their own thing with it, I would imagine. You think so? You think there's so? Well, it'd be good, good for Remelton to see the change come to, maybe you know. Yeah, there's potential in Remelton because our Dean House, uh, which was steeped in tourism history and tradition with eight bedrooms, uh, that is now sold, hmm. and, and that has been taken off the circuit. So that's eight eight beds. In fact, Remelton would be very very short of 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 bedrooms for in the tourism sector or the hospitality sector mm. so there is an opportunity there in, in, in the Lennon Lodge so it's nice to see that we want to say to Seamus and Maureen and indeed the family thanks for all the memories and we wish you well in the future another nice story that I'm looking at here today was it's not an hour people the budget bonanza <laughs> this is the, the cynicism that's going on here budget <laughs> bonanza for the elderly as pensions and fuel grants to rise about three weeks ago there was no way the government could contemplate could no way they could contribute any rises at all. Uh, they were more stuck into the whole idea of holding the pension age at wherever it's now at 66, is it? 66. Rather than take it out to 67. Yeah. It was planned to do that last year, but it was back on the cars this year. But in the middle of that, Mary Lou MacDonald mm-hmm. lobbed in a grenade that pension ages should be reduced to 65, and on top of that, they should get an extra fiver of an increase and all of a sudden this reactive kind of politics and this is good politics by the way because 
Fianna Fáil and Fianna Game is playing reactive politics because Sinn Féin is totally dictating leading it. They're leading the, the agenda. They, they'll, they'll just wait as almost an ambush for Leo or Michael Martin to make a, a story, particularly on, on those social issues. And they were pretty definite in their views. And, and these so was, so was Pascal Donoghue, that we just don't have money. We can't do this and we can't do that. Now we're hit with 3% inflation and every household in Ireland and this year is going to face 400 euros of an increase in their energy bills between oh, electricity yeah. and, and gas and now lo and behold we might not have food for Christmas time God help us all blame Brexit that was that <laughs> that was th- that one 20 years ago I was going to read something out of that there's a couple of things did you have something else to read when I'm looking for it ah, I tell you yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get this thing about yeah. the, there's a nice piece here about uh, by Declan Declan Care about the new alumni association at St. Eunan's College. Um, I'm surprised that I'm sure they would have I thought that maybe it was more informal alumni over the years, but that's the sort of a, a way of associating uh, former uh, students and graduates of the of the college. And sure, as we know, there's been a lot of well-known people have come through, um, but it's open to everybody. Uh, the alumni committee at St. Eunan's College has issued an appeal for all their former students and staff members to join the new association. And they're looking forward to that uh, and hope that all those will call the call St. Union's College, their alma mater, will begin that journey um, as the college celebrates its 115th year of education here in Donegal. All right, we'll move on from that because we're just starting to run out of time here. We want to do a bit on the angry residents reopen a bridge and then this was over at Drummond, that's 20 years ago. Hard to believe it. A local bridge there leading to the National School collapsed and it was closed and closed for months. And we had a clock running on the length of time. I don't have the details here, but I'm, I'll look that, uh, that up. But it was closed for months and months before the engineer, I think it was James Boyd, took it in hand and, and, and replaced the bridge and got on with it. We have another story here that is, is probably very irrelevant, very topical here in Mufford. And it just simply states, Mufford in a new twilight zone. Now, you're going to have to come into town to see why this is. Come in after dark, but if you do, bring... a a bright torch, a bright flash lamp, or even candles, but but wear high vis jackets in case you're not seen, because there's an, an a shocking absence of uh, of lighting, public lighting, working on the on the main street and on parts of the bypass. So we've had a bash at that there, and we understand that in all, in the vicinity of the town centre, there are eighteen lights, not working, and we're. We just asking what else is new in Mufford because this has been the crack down the years. Ian McGarvey used to ask, "Why has the council stayed away for thirty years?" Yeah, it's pretty it's obvious a, with the uh, with the evenings drawn on the way they have. Like they you have. step out. Yeah, we're going a quick uh, look at our at our lead story. Concerns about it might get impact on resale market, and this is Pat Le- Slattery, a Letterkenny based quantity surveyor. He has raised the issue this week where the resale value of houses constructed prior to 2013 could see big reductions when they're sold. And goes on to explain why in, in, in great detail and, and with absolute clarity, because the banks and the financial institutions are now demanding a mica test on all buildings going for sale, mm. including those before, prior to 2013, whereas in previous times they would have accepted the bona fide of an engineer's report. That has now changed. You're going to get a much more detailed uh, chartered uh, surveyor's account. Just and if there's MICA there, yeah, and with MICA there. recurring in, 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 in all quarried materials, in Donegal, the chances of a, a structurally sound house, a very structurally sound house, uh, being turned down because there is MICA there, even though the quantity, the quality of cement and the, and the strength of the rocks is absolutely superb. So that's the lead story, and that's the Tribune for this week, and that's where we shall park it until this time next week, Eamon. Thank you. Cheers, John.